Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really stimulating conference. And when I saw the diversity of background of the speakers, I was really impressed. And I see uh, actually a lot of overlap and convergence. So I'm really looking very much forward for the discussions. So I'm going to talk about a distinction from a computational point of view, and which I hopefully can be useful for neuroscience research, uh, between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning mechanisms. Uh, in brains and robots. And so in the, in the group, we really try to have an interdisciplinary approach where on the left, we use um, formalisms, tools, and so on from maths, physics, engineering, science to try and come up with new uh, computational models for psychology, neuroscience. And in, in the other direction, as you said, sometimes we also take inspiration from what we understand about the brain and test it on robots. But our goal is mostly to use robots as a test bed for biological and psychological hypotheses with really the hope to contribute to a better understanding. Uh, so this morning we've heard about different cognitive functions. Uh, I noted perception, language, memory. But as Goethe wrote a while ago in Amfang Bar Ditat, at the beginning was the act. Sorry guys, wrong starting point. <laughs> the action is the starting point. So in, in this presentation, uh, we'll focus on the decision-making process for action. So if you have a, an animal in, in a maze uh, that, that wants to, to get some food, so the idea, decision-making is the choice at each moment of the most appropriate action. And of course, we have in mind that there's a general survival objective. But of course, when we focus on the task, uh, the goal is to solve a particular task. But we have to keep in mind that, that survival. And we'll get back to that. And so reinforcement learning, it's, it's a theoretical formalism uh, that proposes a way to, to learn by trial and error in order to adapt this choice. And the goal there is to maximize a certain function that we call a reward function. But in machine learning, you hear a lot about cost function and so on. So that's, that's the same thing. And, and the idea is not to focus only on the immediate consequence of action, but to take into account possible long-term consequences. And that's what you see in this function. What you try to maximize, so that's, that's a proposal, and then we can compare to others, is the sum of rewards that we will simplify and consider scalar values, scalar signals we get from the, from the world, from t equals zero, that's present, until up to a potentially infinite horizon. And an important parameter that you have here, gamma, this count factor between zero and one, basically tells you that you should uh, assign higher weights to uh, short-term consequences than to long-term consequences. If you set gamma to be zero, you only focus on the consequence of the first action. If you set gamma to one, that means you give uh, equal weights to all of them. And of course, there's a trade-off, you should use something in between. And so usually with this formalism, we, we model a particular task, a problem, as, as a Markov decision process. So the agent interacts uh, with the environment by producing an action and observes what is the consequence in terms of whether I got a reward or not for that specific action or after that specific action. And even if I haven't yet got any reward, I observe some change in the world. So for example, I press the light button and the light is on, and that is different, potentially a different state that is relevant for the task. And so we describe the problem as a, a set of possible states and in navigation, and I'll use a lot this paradigm as an example. Uh, so part of the information relevant for the states uh, are the location in space, but not only. Uh, there's an action space. And then what drives the dynamics of the task is uh, formalized here with uh, two different functions. So one is the transition function, which basically tells you what is the probability of, of observing state as a function of the state action couple. So for example, if I'm Navigating, I'm in these positions, let's call it state one, and I move towards the north. I don't know, I would say randomly, I have not yet found the time to acquire a cognitive map of Frankfurt. But yeah, okay, I move north and I arrive, let's say 90% of the time in state two. Okay, that's a transition. I, I can learn it through repetition. Basic way to learn it is, for example, a frequentist approach and a, a reward function, which tells you which state action couples in that task are associated with reward. 
And these functions together, so the MDP describes the problem, not, not the solution. And there are different ways then to learn and find a solution to that problem. So this is an example, a scheme of how you can represent a task with three states, S0, S1, S2. Uh, S1 could be here, the only state where you can have a reward. And there are two possible actions, A0, A1. So from state A0, if you perform action A0, you have 50% chance of remaining in the same states, 50% chance of making a transition to state S2 and so on. You can represent probabilistic uh, problems or with some, some probabilities, so stochastic problems, where you can also model uh, deterministic ones. A, a small note, and we'll get back to it at the end of the presentation, uh, the fact that we represent rewards as a simple scalar value doesn't mean that you cannot extend this framework. And there's actually an extension called motivation or reinforcement learning, where you can imagine you have a multi-dimensional space. So here with, for example, one dimension, one type of homeostatic reward, energy. Uh, uh, you could have epistemic rewards, so information you acquire from the world that enables you to reduce uncertainty in your internal representations can be rewarding by themselves. And Carl Friston's uh, active inference theory is a way to combine both. You could have also social rewards and so on. And the idea even is like the, the, the magnitude of the reward or the subjective reward that you will get for performing a particular action might change in time depending on your internal needs. So your motivation for food might fluctuate. And once you get satiated, uh, you get a lower reward for that. But OK, for what I will present for the, the first part of the presentation, we'll assume there's a fixed motivation for food, let's say, in a rodent navigation task. And it's going to produce reward equal one when you get some food. OK. So now let's go to ways to solve this. And so the, in the title, I said model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. From, the, in, from machine learning, these are two different strategies to learn to solve a, a, a Markov decision problem. And they have interesting complementary properties. And the take-home message is, from our understanding, they seem to coexist in the brains of mammals. So it's, we try to understand how they are coordinated. So let's start with model-based reinforcement learning. So learning a world model, an internal model, of the regular statistical regularities of the task. And in the case of navigation, a cognitive map can be considered as, as a world model. So you have this uh, classical Maurice Water maze, a circular arena where an animal can navigate. You have distal cues that help it localize. And so learning a, a cognitive map will consist in exploring, even in the absence of reward. And that's what Tolman used to call latent learning. They have something that is being learned, we don't know exactly, it's, it's hidden, and we'll see probably later the effect. And learning that there are different states, so here these are positions, and this information can be provided by, by the hippocampus, and there are possible transition between these states when you move. So after, let's say, learning a, a, a satisfying model, so you have this map, there's still no reward, but later on you introduce a reward, so here a hidden platform, and making a decision then consists in representing uh, which state is associated to reward in your internal model, where you are, and then performing mental simulations, planning, you have different words for that, until finding, let's say, the shortest path in the graph. So that's one strategy. And actually, one of the earliest evidence that I know about that rodents may have such an ability is from Tolman's work in this famous maze that I think we uh, have always called the Tolman maze. We have a starting point at the bottom, you have some food at the, at the end, and there are three possible paths. There's a shortest path, a long path, and an intermediate one. And what is interesting, once the animal has visited this, is to introduce some obstacles. And when you block this here, what happens most of the time um, uh, is that the animals would go there, realize that the path is, is uh, obstructed, and then directly take the long path, not even trying the intermediate path. Statistically speaking, and I'm happy that the colleagues from Marseille, Vincent Hoc, uh, and others told me recently that they have replicated those behavioral results. And so here is an example of how you can explain this with a model-based strategy from Angelo Arleo's team, where you, you have learned a map and simply learning that one transition is no longer possible. So you cut that transition, then you mentally simulate, and you find that the shortest path is to go along that long path. So that's, that's one way to, to learn and act in the world. And of course, hippocampal place cells are one of the possible substrates that may contribute to that. So we heard about a bit about that this morning. 
Now let's switch to a very different strategy. It's still within the framework, the reinforcement learning framework, we're going to use the same formalism, but a different learning strategy. And the idea is avoiding or not trying to learn an internal model and rather locally learn what are the best actions to select. So if you have uh, state representations, again, it's still the same task. Navi uh, so we'll stick to an allocentric representation. Your states could be represented by positions and, and learning in each position, what is the best action to perform? So imagine you have the current state here, and here is the rewarded state. And each state, the al the, this family of algorithms will try to learn what is the best action, but also to predict the value of future rewards. So trying to estimate that sum of future rewards, and that's what is going to drive learning. So here, we, here is how it works. So initially, the agent explores randomly, and by chance, for the first time, it gets reward, and it's a reward prediction error signal where you compare what you get with what you expected, so your previous estimations of the value uh, signal that will give you a positive surprise that will reinforce, but it will just locally reinforce the previous state and the previous action. And so now you know what to do from that state, but you still need to explore elsewhere. And then you, you continue, you perform another trajectory, and when you reach a state that where you have learned something, even if there is no reward there, so in that reward prediction error equation, uh, reward equals zero, but now you're in a state where you have learned to expect something. You have approximated the value of future reward to be, let's say, 0 0.9, and you come from a state where you didn't know anything, the value was zero, so you reinforce, and that's the process. But the, the thing to keep in mind is that such a model-free strategy is a very slow learning process. You need to repeat it for many, many trials to acquire something. And, and it's even slower to unlearn. So if you change the reward location, you will have to, uh, to locally uh, relearn your behavior. And for a long time, you will still be attracted by the previous platform location. So one of the biological counterparts, and it's very famous in cognitive neuroscience, is the activity of dopaminergic neurons, especially phasic activity when animals learn uh, Pavlovian conditioning tasks, but this has been also then verified later in many different paradigms, instrumental conditioning, navigation, and so on. So these are, uh, this is an example, stereotypical activity of these neurons in passive monkeys that learn to associate the presence, uh, the, pr the presentation of a stimulus on screen. So that would be an indication of one state of the task. And two seconds later, they receive a juice reward directly into their mouth. And so at the beginning of learning, when the animals uh, receive unpredicted rewards, we have this positive response of dopaminergic neurons to that unexpected reward. And that's what the model tells you. If you get a reward, but you were not able to predict it, you should produce a positive reinforcement. After conditioning, so after hundreds of trials, uh, this association is perfectly predicted by the animal. So after presenting the stimulus, you present the reward, it's expected by the animal, and you see that those neurons stereotypically don't respond. So there's no surprise, and that's what the model predicts. If you get something that you predicted, with some value, the difference between the two should be approximately zero, nothing to learn. And even more convincingly, after learning, you, there are some omission trials. So you present the stimulus, the animal expects to get a reward, but doesn't get anything. And what you see is a decrease in the activity, as if there was a negative surprise. So it's worse than expected. And that's what the model predicts. If you don't get a reward, but you expected something, you should generate a negative signal. And from a normative point of view, from the point of view of the model, that might be an indication that the world has changed, the task has changed. So maybe you want to adapt your behavior. That could be a reason for that. Okay, and from that uh, discovery, which uh, is now a while ago, uh, a lot of people have started to develop models to implement that and to relate that to, 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 to the brain. And especially uh, actor critic models are a way to decompose uh, the process into learning to select actions in the actor and learning to predict reward in the critic. And there are good reasons to think that the basal ganglia has important contributions to that. So during my PhD thesis, actually, I came up with my own actor critic model, but also we uh, analyzing uh, ventral striatal activity in behaving rat in a cross maze, we found uh, such uh, activity that was very similar to value predicting signals and that was correlated to the value V in our models. Just a word, because we heard about uh, Yann Lequin this morning and was one of the father of deep reinforcement learning and so on, one of the big names of AI these days. Uh, he does not consider that uh, generative models that, like those used in JGPT and so on uh, are uh, the future of AI. And this is taken from an opinion paper that he wrote last year, 
Well, you see, he makes explicit uh, inspiration from neuroscience and still uh, today the, the notion of actor and critic uh, is, com is, is, is relevant in AI and with the idea that in parallel you, le you learn a world model. And so for him, that's one of the direction towards more intelligent artificial systems. I'm closing the parenthesis. But since this discovery, there are lots of people in cognitive neuroscience that study this also in humans. So you have typically fMRI experiments where humans perform decision-making tasks. They press left button, right button. They have series of monetary reward and you can look for correlations uh, in the brain. The interesting thing is that rather than simply searching for some voxels where you would have an activity for left button press versus right button press or rewarded trials versus non-rewarded, you can fit reinforcement learning models to the uh, behavioral sequence. So you try to maximize the likelihood of this sequence given the model and its parameters. And there are methods for doing approximate Bayesian ways to optimize and compare different models. We contribute to that field too. And then once you have found a good model, you can look inside the model how some variables, so for example, the reward prediction error, have evolved trials after trials. And you can use this as a regressor of brain activity to see whether there might be some regions that encode information that could be well modeled by this process. Okay, let, let's now go to the, the core of the presentation. The idea that those two systems might coexist in the brain. And the question, the central question for our group is, how should we coordinate? So what are efficient ways to, to coordinate these systems? So that's sort of machine learning questions. What is the most efficient in different situations? And from what we learn, can we better understand or contribute to a better understanding of how it's coordinated in, in the brain of different species actually? So if I was to summarize this again in, in the Maurice Water maze, on the left is a representation of a model-based reinforcement learning strategy where you have learned cognitive map and use it. On the right, a model-free one. And each of them, that's the important message here, each of them has its own advantage and, and drawbacks. So making a decision with an internal map uh, predicts long reaction time. Because if the world is large, it takes quite a lot of time to mentally simulate and find the shortest path in the graph. But the good thing is that you can adapt very flexibly to changes in, in the environment. So if you change the platform, the reward location from here to there, one trial is sufficient to update your internal model and say, there's no longer any reward in this associated to this node, there is one here. And then you take some time to, to mentally simulate and the next trial you, you perform appropriately. Now, if you look at model-free strategies, I told you it's very slow learning process, even slower to unlearn. But the good thing about it, so it, it predicts inflexible behavior. And I will argue that, I mean, many people are arguing that might be a good model of habit learning, even in humans. But the good thing about it is that you can make very fast decisions. So deciding in a given state which action to perform consists of just comparing the values of a finite state of actions and sometimes exploring, but that's very fast computationally speaking. So let's look at what this predicts in terms of learning curves. If you put an animal, uh, in such a maze, you will predict that, so days after days of training and within each day, there are several trials of training. If you measure the path length, so how fast the animal uh, was to reach the, the, the reward, you will see a progression, progressive improvement. And if you change the platform location from let's say here to there, you predict with this model that the performance should be even worse than chance at the beginning. I told you that's because even if you learn locally, you reinforce, the actions next to the newly rewarded position, you're still attracted in the other states by the previous reward location. And in many experiments, that's not what, but what is observed in animal behavior. So this is one of the papers of uh, Richard Morris. And you see, that you have this progressive increase. It's interesting that, to see also that there are other things occurring from one day to the other. Sometimes you see degradation of performance. There are many things about sleep, memory consolidation, and so on. I don't think I will have time to speak about that. But you see, at day eight, the performance is degraded, but it's not worse that, than the initial performance. And then there's a fast adaptation. And this, from the point of view of our models, is better explained with a model-based process. Now, the, 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 the evidence or the, yeah, all the elements that suggest that we might sometimes, uh, our behavior might be better modeled as model-based and sometimes more as model-free, uh, uh, come from the, the, the automatization when we uh, repeatedly exposed to the same stable situation. So for example, in navigation, the first time you arrive in a new city, and that's what I did uh, for Frankfurt, 
you look at the map, so this is an allocentric representation. You think, so this is not a map of Frankfurt, but you see that's my hotel place, that's the conference place. And you may remember part of the map doesn't need to be complete, doesn't need to be perfect, but then you can mentally use that to simulate. So for example, you walk in the city and say, oh, I remember there was a museum and you can close your eyes. Yeah, maybe I should turn left. We do a bit of that, right? But when you go every day from your house to your workplace or university, you don't do that anymore. It becomes completely automatic. And it's more like conf visual configurations of the environment that you have repeatedly associated to some particular movements. And even if you're sleepy, you walk and your body will, turn, will make the right turns, right? Or you can talk with somebody else. Anywhere. And this very general process, like there are many things. If you learn to play music and you're playing a concert, thinking about, well, oh, I'm playing piano and let's let's put this finger on this uh, key. Oh, it's the, the best. I mean, there's the worst thing to do because then it's a higher chance to make an error. So you should actually not think about what you do. If you if you perform sport like martial art, you repeat the movement so many times so that it becomes completely intuitive. If you're a craft worker like you sculpt some uh, copper uh, plate and you do this so many times that you, you don't even think anymore about it. But this is also true for many of our daily gestures. Like when you arrive in front of your coffee machine at home, you don't wonder whether, oh, this time will I start by putting the water or the coffee? Not at all. Basically, stereotypically, you execute the same sequence of action. So it seems like a very general process. And it has been shown and argued, especially in the case of instrumental conditioning in rats, where they learn to press a lever to get some food, that this is the, that model-based and model-free uh, distinction is relevant to account for the fact that through overtraining, those animals become less and less flexible in their behavior. And so if, if you have the animals learn to press a lever to get food, and they do this, for, uh, they, they, you train them extensively, you can devalue the reward. For example, you give them a lot of food in their home cage, you put them back here. And if they have been overtrained, you see that they press a lot still as if it had become automatic during a, a test phase in extinction. While if they are goal directed in the, in the words of psychologists or model based in the words of computational neuroscientists, they are more flexible and they stop quickly. So, I would like to show you uh, when uh, some of our models where we try to combine both and study what is the dynamics and, and what it produces and what it predicts in terms of behavior that we could then test experimentally with rats and, and so on. So this is one of the models that we have worked uh, uh, on. So you have several modules, each of them is learning a particular strategy. So you can have a model-free strategy that learns to associate visual cues to actions that could rely on the basal ganglia and so on. It's not important at this stage. You have a model-based strategy, which for example, receives uh, place cells from the hippocampus and builds a, a graph and will propose actions based uh, after mentally simulating. Here, we propose also to externalize uh, exploration in order not to accumulate explore, uh, random exploration from both systems. And that's still something we would love to test uh, whether there's a reason to think that in the brain, there's also so, such an externalization. And we need a way to coordinate them. So this was a, a model where we proposed that one of the roles of the medial prefrontal cortex in rats is to arbitrate between them. And there are many lesion uh, studies that seem to argue in this direction. So it's an associative model that learns in different situations of the task that are given by different visual cue, different position in space, what is the strategy that seems the most appropriate. And so you can simply measure which one works best, how, how much reward you get on average with each strategy and, this, and decide to rely on them. So it's a sort of memory, but at, at yet another level, at a, uh, another hierarchical level. So we tested this model on a rat robot. It was an old project where we were testing and trying to in test uh, an integration of things we were understanding about rat navigation at that time. But one of the central things we, we, we observe, which, which seemed obvious, but it was really contradictory to a lot of theoretical work, even robotics work, was like when you have a robot navigate, so here it's an indoor environment with some simple visual cues around, and you see the place cells that have been learned that are overprinted on this figure, the internal model that the robot will learn is nearly never perfect. Well, actually, in, in the theoretical work, you even have assumptions of perfect information provided by the, by the internal models. So you see, it's, it's, it's not perfect. And so uh, we, we then 
uh, it's like the Morris water maze. There's a, a position indicated in blue, but it's not visible for the, for the robot. That is the place where we will get a reward. And you see, depending on the position of, of, the, of that reward and whether that falls right on one of the nodes of the maps, so on the, on the, at the bottom right, it's a case where the rewarded location is well aligned with one of the nodes of the map. It's easy for the robot to learn. It will plan and go there. But if it falls between nodes, that becomes much more complicated. And just to summarize one uh, a, a result that we got here, when you have only a model-based strategy that controls the robot, it will learn to go near this reward location and then switch to random exploration until finding that, that uh, position. While if you have a combination of both, an emergent property, because we don't tell the system when to use one or the other, it was through this meta-learning, it learned to use one strategy to get closer and switch to the other uh, uh, with the information of visual cue to accurately reach that reward. And I think this is another very interesting thing that I would love to further test in your science. Like in many of the papers in, in, in my literature, people make the assumption that at one trial, you either model-based or model-free, or even during a block of trial, like initially you're model-based and after hundreds of trials of repetition, you become model-free. Well, here we find that maybe within uh, the same trial, the trajectory could be actually uh, governed by both alternatively, which produce a sort of cooperation. So we have actually in some papers derived a lot of simulations and tried to come up with predictions. So one of the applications of the models to try to model uh, rat behavior in a real neuroscience experiment was uh, performed by Laurent Dollet um, uh, during his PhD thesis. So it's, a, it's an extension of the Maurice Water Maze. You have again a hidden platform there is a flag now that is next to it, but it's not right on it. Otherwise, that would be too easy. So you cannot simply use a beacon strategy to go towards it, but it's 10 centimeters away. So, so the, what they call in the paper is like, you need a sort of heading vector. So you can use it, but not completely rely on it. And the, the big difficulty of the task is every four trials, the platform location will change. That means you need to constantly adapt. So they tested in that paper control rats, and rats with a lesion of the hippocampus. And here you see again these learning curves for, where sessions after sessions, again, many trials within each session, I don't remember which number, you measure the escape latency, the time required to reach the platform. So in blue are the controls, in green are those with lesion. And for each of these groups, you can see the performance at the first trial, so platform location has just changed, and the performance at the fourth trial, so just before the next change. So there are several interesting features in that behavior. So first, you see a, a fast adaptation, a fast improvement of performance from the first trial to the fourth trial. If you have an intact hippocampus, so between the, the blue curves, the plane and dashed line, but not when you have a lesion of the hippocampus. So it seems that the hippocampus is crucial for this fast adaptation. So that's the first observation. Second one, if you look carefully, you see that at the first trials, actually animals with a lesion of the hippocampus are better, significantly better than control animals. And one possible reason is that the hippocampus not only helps you build cognitive maps, but because you use those maps, you are attracted by the previous uh, location. And the third interesting observation is that sessions after sessions, all the performance of, the, of these animals seem to converge so that in the end, they get some, some good performance in all these cases. So in our view, maybe, a good coordination between the two strategies has been progressively learned specifically for that task that produced this. And so this is one of the curves we, we generate with, with a model. And in this paper, we, we also simulated uh, um, uh, six different experiments. We also test, we lesion different parts of the model to, to come up with predictions. We compared with alternative ones. And in, the, in the, that specific task, you really need a coordination of strategies and you need both a cognitive mapping process and an associative process with what we've tested so far to produce this kind of behavior. So I'm, I hope I, I'm not going too fast. I hope it's not, uh, I will give you another example of a ro robotics work. Maybe that's uh, more different from what uh, the things you see usually, uh, just to, to, to raise a new, new, some new predictions we came up with recently. So in this case, 
Uh, it's more recent experiments we did with, again with a robot navigating indoor, and we wanted to get closer to, uh, but didn't want to reproduce exactly, but the, the tall man made. So we have different corridors and some are short path, long path, and we, we can block some of them with obstacles and see what, what happens. So here is the map that has been learned by the robot after exploration. And what is interesting is that coordinating model-based and model-free reinforcement learning here leads to a, a certain dynamics. I forgot to say something very important is um, usually in the models, people, uh, so as I said, uh, will measure the average performance you get with one of each, uh, with each system and you choose the, the, the most reliable, the most efficient one. But we thought actually when you use your map to mentally simulate, I told you it takes a lot of time. So that's, there's a high computational cost. And we want to test the hypothesis that this computational cost is explicitly used in the arbitration so that if the two systems produce the same performance, you should follow the one that is the least costly, the model free here. So what we have added here is something that measures on average how much time do you take to make a decision when you rely on one strategy or the other. So in general, this produces alternation. So it's again time, number of actions performed. This uh, vertical line is the first moment where the robot got a reward. Uh, and then at, after uh, 1,600 actions, so it had learned the task, we changed. In this case, I think it was changed in uh, reward position, but sometimes it's uh, introduction of an obstacle. And you see those faces where the system, it actually relies all the time on both, alternates, but there are faces where one of the strategies is dominant. What is interesting is that because you try to minimize the cost, it predicts that initially it's not worth using your internal model because you don't know yet where is the reward. So you there's a high cost and it will not bring an advantage. So exploration is driven mostly by model free. And then you learn to use your model, you apply it efficiently, that accelerates learning. And then you have this habituation process where you rely less and less on model base. So that's this third phase where behavior is mostly driven by model free. And so you see this kind of, of uh, alternations. And if you measure the performance, so the cumulated reward through time, we compare many different models. So with our coordination criterion, we are non-different from the optimum, but you can now also represent the computational cost. And cost is, here is measured on the number of iterations in the model before finding a solution. And you see that compared to a pure model-based strategy where you're always replanning, you reduce, you divide the, the computational cost by three. So that means with this coordination, you can produce uh, good performance in, in simple tasks, but also reduce cost. See, uh, um, an anecdote, when we submit this kind of work to more robotics or AI um, journals or conferences, you always have reviewers that say, what is this uh, by your inspiration? We don't care. You should do a deep, uh, uh, use a deep network and perform. So we, we try to re respond to one of the reviewers and tested the deep neural network there. But you know, in deep reinforcement learning literature, they take millions of actions before finding a good solution. I wanted to show it like the, the task here is so simple that you, in, in, in a few thousands of uh, uh, actions, the, the network produces you know, uh, not satisfying performance. And the reviewers, they will report, oh, no, that's exactly not exactly what I meant. Reject. And that's it. So, you know, so it's part of the, of the game when you're really between disciplines. But OK, we find places where to see. Um, but so here. And, and, and that's what, uh, something I would love to, 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 to seek tested or to collaborate on is the idea that maybe, and I think it makes sense, maybe uh, within the brain, the mechanisms for arbitrating between strategies should not only uh, look at the performance we get, the amount of reward we get following one strategy or the other, but costs. So there could be cognitive costs, energy costs, and so on, also play a role. So in that specific uh, case, it would be lovely to see whether we can find uh, a neural correlate of, of computational costs and whether that plays a role. So we have applied this framework. I just wanted to say, well, to open for maybe later discussions, we have applied this to different uh, species, different paradigms. So these are, this is work that we've done uh, trying to model rat behavior in Pavlovian conditioning tasks. Very simple. So again, you have lever pressing, there's a stimulus appearing. Eight seconds later, later the, you have to you get, you get some reward. What is interesting, this was a, a paper initially by Shelley Flagel, Terry, Robin, Terry Robinson, is that you end up finding inter-individual differences. You have animals in the same task, they get the same performance on average, but some animals are, are called sign trackers. They are attracted by the signs or the stimuli that predict reward. And some other animals are more are called goal trackers. They are attracted by the, the, the reward location. Actually, you have also intermediate uh, behavioral profiles. And even more interesting uh, observation that they made is like 
the dopamine reward prediction error signal that I showed you, they could find it only in sign trackers and not in goal trackers. And so we came up with a computational model to explain, propose a, a possible explanation in terms of different contribu relative contribution of the two systems, and we can well explain those different behaviors, but also that enabled us uh, to predict that some manipulation of the task, and actually here was just the, the inter-trial dura uh, duration, was critical to, to produce that, uh, that, that, those behaviors, because if you have a long inter-trial interval, the animals will have a lot of time to go see the reward location, get frustrated because there's nothing and revise its value. And so we predicted with, that with shorter uh, inter-trial uh, duration, we should observe a, a higher proportion of gold trackers in the population, and also that we should see a restored dopamine reward prediction error also in these animals. And we were lucky that our colleagues uh, in, in, at NIH in the US, Matt Rush, Jeff Schoenbaum, tested exactly this protocol and they, they confirmed those hypotheses. Then of course, their experimental observation go much beyond the model. So there's room to improve further the model. But that shows you one of the, for us, interesting thing about computational models that you can predict things, test them and, and continue this dialogue. Do I have time? Yeah, I, I think I have time for this. So. I wanted to, to emphasize also that it's not just for rodent, not, neither for rodent navigation that is relevant. Uh, in humans also, there seems to be a, 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 co a combination of the two. So this is a very simple instrumental task performed by humans, and it's Andrea Brovelli in Marseille who did the experiments. Well, simply they learned to associate different stimuli, so blue, uh, red, or, or green uh, disc on the screen, to different actions. So here, pressing, uh, using different fingers. And they do this, and once they have found the, the associations, they have to, to repeat them. And so here we, we again use this uh, framework. So we compared models that are model-based only, model-free only, or different ways to coordinate them. And we tested uh, models from the literature. So for example, there are some performance-based coordination mechanisms, as I was saying initially. Uh, there are some weighted-based mixtures that have been proposed by some people. And we proposed uh, this way of using the entropy in, in the uncertainty that you have uh, and so the process that we have in this model-based system is like it, it's uh, you you continue to 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 mentally simulate until you have uh, enough information so reduce uh, uncertainty and then you make a decision so that is interesting because that helps us say they are not simply mentally simulating for a long time versus being automatic and that's fast but we can have gradual changes of reaction time that we predict with the model and uh, to make the, the story short, uh, what is interesting is that trying to fit not only choices made by participants in tasks, but also reaction times gives you two dimensions and gives you further indication that there's a contribution of both. So here I'm showing the choices, so the probability of correct response, and a dashed line are the data from the, from the, the participants. So you see they learn very fast trials after trials, and then they, they stick to a good performance in this simple task. This is a, the best fit with model free only strategy, uh, best fit with model based only, best fit with the combination of both. Of course, you can get a good fit to the, the choices of for by each of these uh, models if you only fit that criterion. But because here we, we try to find the parameters that gives the best compromise between choice and reaction time, you need a model based and model free coordination to produce that. And what is interesting is that you observe a non monotonic variation of reaction time. So initially, the subjects are, uh, respond fast, they start to make errors, they slow down, and then they, they accelerate. And there's even predicted by the winning model, a slight uh, increase uh, acceleration, probably with this automatization. And so what is then very interesting is that you can look inside the model, what, was the, what were the weights of this different system? And actually we predict, so we extract from the model that during trials after trials, the model-based system should be mostly used initially and then reduced, but it should be used up to 20%, which is kind of small compared to this idea that initially you're 100% model-based and you automatize and you switch to model three. So it's interesting that you could test this further uh, experimentally. Uh, before finishing, um, I wanted to tell you that yet other people in AI research are, are using a lot of neuroscience uh, inspiration these days. And so uh, this idea of combining model-based and model-free processes is also at the core of the AlphaGo algorithm that Google DeepMind came up with to, to play Go against Bayer. So there's, you have a model-based strategy which builds a tree of all possible configuration of the game depending on your moves. 
And, and, and you have also model-free strategies where you have deep neural networks that have been trained on databases of human expert positions. So you learn sort of actor, which action is the best to perform. But you also learn in different position, different configuration, what is the value that is expected. And there's a hybrid strategy in the end because the values, so the predictions of reward, are used to decide which branches of the tree should be explored through mental simulation. So that's, again, uh, and the, the inspiration from neuroscience is, is explicitly made by, by these people. So there's, again, an opportunity for exchanges between these disciplines. So I wanted to finish this presentation by um, presenting some very recent work we've done. Um, and with this question, is this computational framework relevant to model some of the hippocampal reactivations that we observe in rats during navigation? So if you think about reactivation, so reactivations, I'm, I'm using this word to be sort of agnostic about the, what is the mechanism in the first place. A lot of people talk about replay, uh, but actually you could do replay. So what happens actually, these animals sometimes stop uh, so the, um, uh, when they are awake performing the task and you can decode activity in the hippocampus that suggests that they might be mentally simulate or they are replaying some, some events that occur. And actually from a computational point of view, you can produce this kind of reactivations in two different manners, depending on whether you use your model-free system or your model-based system. So a model-free uh, replay consists in storing all the events in a sort of episodic memory buffer with time, what was the state, which action I have performed, what is the arrival state, and whether I got a reward or not. And you could store all of this in memory and replay it. And that's, I think, the initial idea behind the experiments, uh, I mean, what people have in mind classically when they study uh, hippocampal replay. And, and actually, if you have this buffer, you could, you could replay in the forward order, and that, seemed, that, could that would produce forward sequences as if you were mentally simulating yourself moving in the maze, or you could even revert the buffer and which is a way to produce backward sequence that have been observed in hippocampal experiments. And this idea of using a backward buffer is, a, is an old idea from machine learning by Lin in 92, which uh, turns out to be more efficient because if, once you get a reward, uh, you, you directly propagate the reward from the state where you got it to the preceding state. So you increase the value and then from that state, you, you propagate the value and so on. So that, that, that is efficient. So that could be one reason, but you could do this completely differently with a model-based strategy. And actually that predicts slightly different things. So a model-based strategy consists in mentally simulating, I told you, some possible trajectories in, in, the, in the internal model. Uh, so that's one strategy that is called trajectory sampling. But it's another way of mentally simulating, which gives a priority to states in the world that have been associated to surprising events when you were acting in the real world. And this is called prioritized sweeping. It's yet another old work from machine learning from the beginning of the 90s. There are two papers that were saying basically the same thing. So globally, the animal, so what it predicts, the animal has experienced some reward. So the first time it was surprising, so it has stored this in memory. And so then when it stops after getting that reward, you, you, it picks this state because that was the, the one with the highest level of surprise. You update the value in your model-based system. And then because you have an internal model, you know what are the neighbor states of that state. So you can propagate. That's what is shown, illustrated here with these blue arrows. You propagate, you compute what it would produce as surprise for the neighbor state. And there's one of them that has the highest level of surprise. So you pick that one, you update the value, you propagate again, and so on. And what is very interesting with this strategy is if you have a maze with corridors, that produces backward replay because that constrains the trajectory and the neighbors to which you would propagate. So that's the rewarding state. You just got a reward and, you, and the neighbor state, which is relevant is the preceding one and so on. And that produced backward replay. Uh, so that could be yet another pot potential explanation for backward replay in the hippocampus. And Matar and Do and ourselves, the same year actually we came up with, with really the similar idea of reusing that prioritized sweeping. In their paper, in the supplementary, they have a very nice theoretical demonstration of why it's useful in terms of expected reward for the long term to use this kind of strategy. But then because it's, it's, it's mostly theoretical, the way they do it is a bit unrealistic where you, do a need, you need to do a lot of computation to measure this uh, utility of performing replay and then you start doing replay. While in our paper, we came up with a more heuristic based approach which costs much less. So there are slightly different predictions that come from the two. And so we made simulations 
uh, in a simplified version of uh, Dave Reddish multiple teammates. So there are the animals are starting from here, and then they need to decide to go to the left or the right. You have two different rewarded sites, and for 100 trials, the reward will be on the left, and after some time, you can change the reward location to another position. And when you, you have this, what is interesting is that it predicts th there's as an emergent property that there are specific moments where the agents should stop to reperform mental simulation uh, to reperform replay. And that's basically the beginning of the task where the uncertainty is the highest or after any change in reward location. So the vertical line after 100 trials is a moment where the reward location change. So I start again to be surprising events and it predicts that the agent should stop and perform. So this is the logarithm number of replay cycles in the algorithm. So you see it predicts that the animal should slow down, take more time to make decisions and then reaccelerate. And it's completely emerging from, from the algorithm. It didn't set this uh, on purpose. Then you can look back at the simulations as if you were, we were uh, experimental neuroscientists and measure whether we find sequences of reactivation of states in the, simula in the mental simulations during, during those reactivation. And so here are the, there are different models, but the one that is of interest for us is this prioritized sweeping model-based process. And we find that we get about 20% of the time backward sequences and 80% of the time unordered sequences that we are not able to, to label. So this is illustrated here. So in those schemes, just to show what it means. So you have a, a, the circle represent the agent. It's immobile. It just got a reward. So backward sequence means you reactivate uh, states that are neighbors to, to each other. And unordered, that means you have reactivated one state here, then another one here, another one here. What is interesting is from the experimentalist point of view, this looks like noise, those unordered sequence. But here in the model, it's the same mechanism, the same prioritization, which is at play. That means we can further test and add a second reward or change the, the location to see whether the mechanism still explains and whether that varies the number, the proportion of unordered sequences that we should observe. I think it's a powerful tool to, to, to drive future experiments. And that's uh, some of the things we are currently doing. Another interesting thing you could look at is where the agent spontaneously, the simulated agent stopped to perform those replay. And, and what we find is that, so this is a heat map of where it spent most of the time stopping. And you see that it spent most of the time at the reward sites to perform replay. That's because that's where the surprising events occur. But we know from the experiments that rats also stop a lot around decision areas, probably because that's regions where they have uncertainty. And that's where I come to the last part of my talk is something on which we've been working in the last six months. We get back to this idea that the reward that the uh, um, that biological agents might be trying to optimize are not just the food reward that you get. There are other types of reward if you take into account the usefulness that they can have for the life the, the lifespan. So here, what we have combined is the one reward dimension, so motivation for food, but also an epistemic reward. That means the potential for uncertainty reduction is considered rewarding, and so. We have those two rewards, and now it's as if the new model was learning to select action that maximize the sum of the two, and we have played with a parameter that weights the uh, epistemic reward compared to the classical reward. And first, it's important to show that it's, it's, it's useful in terms of performance, and actually that such epistemic reward makes the model more curious, and that is very advantageous if you have very distant large reward and small proximal rewards. If you are not curious enough, you will focus on the small immediate one. Well, if you have, if you have a, a, an epistemic uh, mechanism, you will be attracted to explore and find the best solution. So that's what we show here, that it leads to higher performance in, in complex uh, environments. But now let's look back at these uh, multiple teammates and where the agents stop to perform those reactivations. And you see now that it's spending a lot of time uh, in decision area. And that's because there's a lot of uncertainty. These are areas where you have choices to make between left and right. So there's a potential for uncertainty reduction and that's why it spent a lot of time doing this. So we would love in, in the forthcoming months, years to see whether that helps, uh, whether we can confront this to hippocampal recordings and see whether epistemic uh, value also play a role. I'm, uh, I'm done, I've been already a bit long. And so in summary, what I wanted to argue is that um, um, through a strong AI neuroscience exchanges, I think there's a lot of ideas to share and, and, and drive for future experiments. So I've talked about this central idea that we are studying that 
different learning strategies might have different advantages. So we call them model-based, model three. I don't want to, you to think that we only think in terms of dichotomy, in terms of navigation, there are, there are other strategies, there are other different ways. But okay, that's simple enough uh, to, to already, uh, we think, uh, make us extract a lot of knowledge. And so the important thing is that model three strategy is something that is slowly learned, but enables fast decision. A model-based strategy uh, enables fast adaptation, so more flexibility, but at the cost of slow decision-making. And it seems like the, that the brain of mammals coordinate both. And hippocampal replay could also uh, awake hippocampal uh, reactivations, could be both um, uh, correspond alternatively to, to the model-based and model-free reactivations. And I try to illustrate ways to extract model-driven predictions. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank my collaborators and some of this code is, is available online. Thank you.